So I guess I kind of want to preface this of like um, something uh, that is very exciting to me, but is also in a sense uh, quite contradictory um, in my own thinking about it in the sense that like, um, well, one, I screwed up. I meant to send Jason another short text that was useful. Um, I think it's okay. I'm going over it a bit. Um, and two, uh, in some of the terms of this, like, it seems like, uh, so robust and so quaint at the same time. So it's sort of hard to, uh, find the place of the workers inquiry. And maybe that's the sort of, I think that's the sort of question that I think is a sort of good question to keep in mind. Uh, well, what is the place of this inquiry? Um, don't want to overinflate it, but also don't want to go, so what, you know, there is something to it. Um, that said, um, excuse me for any sort of like scatterbrainness because of this tying into my like, uh, sort of partial theoretical apparatus is not so, uh, clear even to myself. So, you know, feel free to interrupt me, um, as well. Um, but with that said, I'll get into it. Um, so workers inquiry, um, uh, is this sort of method methodology of uh, class composition, a theory of class composition. Um, and so how do I minimize this? Okay, there we go. Um, so I sort of see it in a certain sense as the ground zero of Marxist politics. Uh, as analysis is sort of peeking into uh, what Marx calls the hidden abode of production. Um, and uh, quite simply in its most basic form, the worker's inquiry focuses on the uh, experience of the worker at work. Um, but it's not just a study of working conditions uh, of the kind that are periodically conducted by like bourgeois sociologists, uh, but is um, really a study of some of the uh, most fundamental dynamics of capitalism uh, itself, uh, you know, the, the confrontation of labor and capital. Um, it seeks to analyze uh, this antagonism and its unfolding through uh, pro proletarian um, struggles and capital's response to these struggles. So uh, there's a sort of dialectic here. Um, and so like, uh, as uh, Robert Arvet says in Workers Inquiring Global Class Struggle, uh, an inquiry uncovers the tactics, strategies, organizational forms and objectives of both capital and workers with the intention of providing the necessary information about, about, about the positions of power of each in order to further the success of the worker's struggle. In this way, just as the methods of anthropology, psychology, sociology, and engineering are partisan, intended to serve the interests of dominant economic, political, and social institutions, a worker's inquiry is similarly partisan in its intention to serve the interests of the workers. For this reason, workers' inquiries are sometimes referred to as co-research, militant co-research or militant inquiries. The intention is to uncover capital's weakness, identify tactics that would create leverage to exploit these choke points, strategies that assert and shift power to workers at the point of production or reproduction, and the objective of extracting a series of concessions that make the workforce ungovernable in order to disrupt the capital accumulation process. Uh, what a good summary, uh, in my opinion. Um, see where am I at um it's not working oh okay um so uh Marx uh you know did the first one kind of uh but his is his is a sort of uh 100 que question questionnaire uh but the short paragraph is really interesting um and uh what he says is um we hope to meet this work with the support of all workers in town and country who understand that they alone can describe with full knowledge the misfortune from which they suffer and that only they and not the, not saviors sent by providence can ener energetically apply the healing remedies for the social ills which they are prey. We also rely upon socialists of all schools who being wishful for social reform must wish for an exact and positive knowledge of the conditions in which the working class, the class to whom the future belongs, works and moves. Um, 
what I, I think is important to touch on here is that I think um, that this uh, document of Marx's uh, really follows from his analysis of capital. Um, like, uh, it's not just like, like, like in capital, uh, capitalism is the object, right? It's this, it's the, or the subject, I guess, of, of study. Um, but there's a sort of uh, mirrored side to this, which is the, uh, which is the workers. Um, and he, he, he uses um, the factory reports to analyze capital uh, and the, the, the fuller elaboration of uh, the conditions of the workers is sort of uh, in the background a little bit, but all, you know, it's amazing in a certain sense, uh, of course. Um, uh, so um, it's not like, like capital itself has to um, account for workers struggling against it as part of uh, capitalism processes. It's not um, just like uh, uh, the, the, the machine doesn't work as smoothly as it claims it does. Um, and so, um, okay. But uh, I guess I want to point on to, maybe I should skip all of this stuff. I got a little too into the um, production process. I think it's just important um, to a certain extent is this idea of the hidden abode of production and the uh, way, the place of production in Marx's um, analysis of capital of like, you know, everything follows from production. Like we define capital, uh, capitalism as a mode of production. Um, uh, and he will talk about the valorization process, uh, which he says, um, you know, which is the creation of new value, um, like, uh, the extension of work past the point of, um, the reproduction of, uh, the, the value for the worker's means of subsistence, a uh, whole idea of surplus value that, uh, comes from, uh, you know, is, uh, exploitation. Um, so um, there's something sort of interesting, I guess. Okay, I'm skipping all that. Um, oh, one thing that's very um, important, I think, is that uh, in this uh, text of Marx, it, it implies a connection between um, proletarian knowledge and proletarian politics. Um, is that like we we uh, need this? knowledge and only the, the worker has this knowledge of um and, it, and it's sort of to me um what, what i think of is like sometimes like i'll hear people say like material conditions material conditions yada 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 but it's sort of almost like a hand wavy magic word oh we're materialists the material conditions well what are these mythical material conditions um this is the point of workers inquiry really is to give uh is to demystify the material conditions to give them content, specific content, exact and positive knowledge of the conditions of the working class. Um, so this is a sort of little text by Marx. It didn't really have too much going on in the early 20th century, but um, it was picked up uh, by the Johnson Forest tendency, which um, consisted of people, uh, CLR James, I'm going to butcher her name. She was like Trotsky's secretary, uh, Raya Duny, yes, I'm not even gonna try, and Grace Lee Boggs. Um, and well, they were sort of part of the uh, workers' party. They broke with um, the workers' party um, over some pretty complex stuff. Actually, it's a lot more than just um, the bureaucratic collectivism or state capitalism, which they went on to develop the, state, the theory of state capitalism but uh, they sort of rediscovered workers' inquiry and uh, gave it even a more thorough and um, uh, powerful form, I think. Um, and so in 1947, they published American Worker, which documents the conditions uh, and experiences of workers in an American car factory. Uh, first part is a workers' inquiry uh, written by Paul Romero, and the second part is a theoretical analysis of, by Rhea Stone, uh, pen name Grace Lee Box. Um, the, uh, and then like what was sort of interesting about this is the sort of um, way that this has a sort of uh, positive effect of like building sort of like worker solidarity through like shared experience in the uh, uh, formulation of this in a pamphlet 
and the uh, uh, like bourgeois dismissal of this is like, who gives a shit? Um, so, you know, um, I'll just read the quote, I guess. The rough draft of this pamphlet was given to workers across the country. Their reaction was this one. They were surprised and gratified to see in print the experiences and thoughts which they had rarely put into words. Workers arrived home from the factory too exhausted to read more than the daily comments. Comics yet. Most of the workers who read the pamphlet stayed up well into the night to finish the reading once it had started, in direct contrast to the attitudes of the intellectuals who are detached from the working class. To them, it was a repetition of an off written story. Oops. They felt cheated. They, wait, sorry. Um, uh, I guess I'll keep going. Uh, there was too much dirt and noise. They could not see the content for the words. The best expression of what they had to say was, so what? It was to be expected, for how could those so removed from the daily experience of the laboring masses of the country expect to understand the life of the worker as only the worker can understand it? Um, and, like, yeah, you know, the more proletarian history, you know, far-reaching change at the end, the classic stuff. Um, well, then, you know, it sort of makes its way back to Europe with uh, two groups, uh, socialism, E. Barbary, uh, Socialism or Barbarism, a French journal that ran from 1948 to 1967, published the writings of Cornelius Castoradis and Claude Lefort. Um, and uh, the American Worker was reprinted in the first issue. Um, and they also sort of uh, had a, you know, their own opinions about what workers' inquiry is. And this is probably best um, exemplified by Claude Lefort's The Proletarian Experience. Um, but a lot of the question is about like, the role of the researcher and the worker and the uh, production. Um, and he says the proletariat fabricates the objects to which human life continues in all domains because there is no one who does not owe his conditions of existence to industrial production. That's a great line. Um, and they had a similar split with the Fourth International over the state capitalist uh, uh, bureaucratic collectivism, more or less. Um, but operismo is a little bit different because um, their sort of departure comes from uh, analysis of the changing nature of the state after uh, World War II and the October Revolution, uh, rise of like a Keynesian state and Taylorist management techniques. Um, so they sort of start to see the state in uh, as as a key to this pro as as part of this process of like. Uh, mediating between labor and uh, capital, but through very um, brutal, like um, legal means uh, uh, that what, what, what they'll say sometimes is uh, that forcefully reassert the law of value. Um, but so they also translated the American worker early on and they developed the theory of cap class composition, which um, uh, I think gave workers' inquiry uh, more focused in uh, consideration as methodological foundation of class composition, in the sense that there is a, a, a theoretical uh, 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 object or that is like produced, like a sort of like this is the point of class of workers' inquiry, um, and uh, ran zero pans area a god dang. Uh, but this is an interesting quote of one of his texts. The worker as owner and seller of his labor power enters into the relation with capital only as an individual. Cooperation, the mutual relationship between workers only begins with the labor process. But by then, they have ceased to belong to themselves. On entering the labor process, they are incorporated into capital. And this is a sort of like really important thing for like uh, the uh, operismo. Uh, is the sort of um, how do I say the 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 con, uh, conjunction of the labor process with the valorization process? Um, as in, uh, what's important here is that, in a sense, uh, they're, they're very clear in the sense that like labor provides the conditions for capital, and capital provides the conditions for labor, uh, which uh, determines it as abstract labor. Um, a very specific type of labor uh, in capitalism. Sorry, my mouth is um, dry. Um, yeah, th so there was obviously 
some shit going on. Uh, May 68, I, I thought it was really interesting. And I uh, thought the Fiat factory um, in 1969. Um, so let's get to class competition. So class composition is, in a sense, um, ultimately sort of, if you look at the sort of left-hand side on the top, uh, you can see an arrow going down. That would sort of say uh, the, the sort of flow of how the compositions take shape, which one follows from which. Um, so uh, this is sort of like, you know, the, the political composition, or, or let me just, you know, say the thing in order, I guess. Uh, the technical composition is the organization of workers into the working class. You know, this is at work. Um, this is when they're, you know, doing the thing. They're mediated by the machines. You know, uh, you have the, you know, like, for instance, like um, Amazon factories would be a very is a very interesting case of this and how uh, the whole factory is designed to keep workers to, from having to have as minimal contact with each other. Um, so that's a sort of you know, uh, uh, arrangement of the technical composition of the working class that is also the technical composition of uh, capital, uh, you know, that's sp you spread out through the workplace. You could sort of see this. Um, a social composition, organization of working class into class society. So this is the uh, uh, post-work reproduction, you know, uh, get off work, have a beer, watch some, uh, you know, YouTube, some Ben Shapiro, you know, whatever, pick your poison. Um, and then the political composition, uh, which is the organization of class society into a political force. Uh, this is, you know, when the uh, sort of workers put their heads together and, uh, you know, win some shit or lose some shit. Uh, they're sort of either have a recomposition, you know, ability to recompose as a political force, uh, respond to capital, organize themselves politically and threaten the state apparatus. And then uh, decomposition as well, which is, you know, this is a sort of dialectic, uh, the capital's effort to undermine workers' power through restructuring of technical and social compositions to restore and maintain its domination. Um, in this sense that like uh, the process of class struggle gets integrated into capitalism. Uh, and um, so, uh, Class composition is then both the product and the producer of struggles over the social relations of the capitalist mode of production. Um, and then a quote from the reading, capitalist exploitation is not an abstract idea. It always takes particular material forms. Through class struggle, capitalism changes itself. This creates new technologies and work processes. It involves the movement of people and capital to new parts of the world, developing new industries. The terrain of class struggle changes along with the working class itself. We need to analyze this terrain to find out where capital is weak and where workers are strong. What are our forces? How do we attack? There's only one way to find out is within the class struggle itself. Therefore, work is inquired is not just uncover the changing forms of work, but the changing forms of struggle. And this is sort of like really important in the sense that like, you know, uh, I think there's, I can't remember who, which one of these turds said it, but it's like, um, you know, as, as, as a sort of working class composite itself, this is also a big reorganization of the technical composition of capital, the introduction of new machinery, more efficiency, more space between the workers, less communication, a whole apparatus to decompose the class. Um, and then, so we'll start with the technical composition. Um, okay. Okay, good thing I skipped all that. Good, good on me. Okay, so um, okay, so I already said all that stuff. Okay, so I'm just gonna read this. Uh, the technical composition of the working class is obviously work itself, the subject of work, its organization, its instruments. Um, like I said, uh, and it's um, I, I kind of already said this, but it's two sides of the same coin. It's like. Uh, variable capital and uh, constant capital. Uh, it's uh, two sides of the organic composition of capital because, you know, um, you know when the, as, as I said before, when the um, worker enters into, uh, uh, you know, the capitalist relations of production, he's uh, no longer just, you know, 
working on something, he's he becomes capital. Um, you know, living living variable capital. Um, uh, so yeah, so of course, mediated through the machines. I said this a bunch, um, and of course, one of the best quotes of Marx here: "Beautiful, beautiful, scary." As capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital, but capital has one sole driving force, the drive to valorize itself, to create surplus value, to make its constant part, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. Capital is dead labor, which vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labor, and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. Um, Okay. All right. So, of course, you know, we have our from aboves and our from belows. This is a reoccurring theme. Um, but a from above inquiry would be um, a sort of hybrid creature between this sort of um, uh, bourgeois sociological uh, investigation into the working conditions, uh, you know, for capital, like. Uh, uh, but like, uh, so, you know, that sort of method applied to uh, a workers inquiry for, you know, secretarian uh, revolutionary goals. Um, so like Marx's original inquiry is an example of this. Um, but the from below inquiries, uh, you know, the more pr preferable of the two um, is the former inquiry most apt to um, consisting of both knowledge production and militant organization, which is sort of like the, that's the sort of goal is to have these two things, right? Like, uh, and this is in, you know, the, in, in capital as well, the contradiction between the, uh, uh, the uh, technician and the worker, the intellectual and the manual worker, intellectual labor, manual labor. Uh, so like to, you know, to deal with this uh, in organizational practice. Um, uh, also known as militant co-research, uh, you know, this is where the theory comes from the workers themselves in a sense, uh, you know, the, the workers and researchers, these lines are blurred. Um, and Robert Ovetz uh, uh, outlines three tasks of the workers inquiry. Uh, one to identify and understand capital's weaknesses and choke points, which are these, uh, you know, upstream of uh, the supply chain. He's talking about logistics in this sense, um, how to best attack you know, strategies, tactics, forms of organization. How are we gonna, um, you know, uh, stop the val stop the process? Uh, um, and, uh, you know, uh, really, you know, put pressure on the fuckers. Um, and two, to assess the strength and weaknesses of workers' ability to combat capital. You know, how is, how, how much potential for there is organizing at this work with? How, what are, if they're organizing and actively engaged in certain struggles, um, Ha, like, you know, what is their sort of horizon? Where, where can they go, you know? Uh, so in a certain sense, um, the workers inquiry should uh, be sort of focused on uh, certain um, singularities within different working processes that would lead to have something sort of uh, specific, uh, you know, a sort of well, which business do you want to do a workers inquiry uh, with, uh, which workplace? Uh, it's not very good to like, you know, my friend has a landscape company. I work for him. I'm going to do a workers inquiry. I work for my friend. This is pointless. Fuck that. Um, and the third is to develop dynamic cycles of class composition. Uh, so this is a decomposition, recomposition. How is this whole, you know, capital and labor, uh, you know, sort of tearing at each other and recomposing into these new conglomerates taking shape? Um, and then we're going to get into a sort of a little more technical thing, not really, but uh, very interesting and very uh, useful uh, because it uses the commodity form to uh, analyze like uh, reproduction and uh, capital. Uh, well, obviously capital, but like reproduction, you know, this, the, um, I'll, I'll just read the quote because like, so, or I'll start on the left, never mind. Uh, so uh, if anyone doesn't know, uh, money be only becomes capital when $100 becomes $110. Um, is a circuit of buying in order to sell, um, or I wrote consuming in order to produce the alienated project of the other. The capitalist consumes the labor power of the worker, uh, and uh, you know, then we get something new. Uh, expressed by a formula MCM prime, 
which is, you know, the money, commodity, money, but more money, but it's more money. So, well, how do we get there? Uh, so we have with Marx, we have money, commodity, uh, then labor, means of production, uh, production, commodity prime. So we have cotton and some shit. We have a baseball hat, sell the baseball hat. We got some more money. Nice. Um, our friend money bags. Uh, labor power is reproduced and um, uh, the working class through the inverse circuit, selling in order to buy or producing in order to consume the alienated product of another expressed in the formula, commodity, money, commodity. Um, so you uh, work, you go to work, you make some fucking baseball hats or whatever, and you get a wage so you can go buy food at the grocery store, uh, an alien product of the other. Um, so to quote, uh, if, so if MCM prime is the general formula for capital, what is uh, CMC? It is a general formula for working class reproduction. The working class sell their labor power in exchange for a wage through the process of work. They then exchange this wage for the commodities necessary for them to re reproduce their labor power, otherwise known as a means of subsistence. These commodities are transformed back into labor power, and then the whole cycle begins again. Uh, yeah, right, you know, production. Uh, I don't know why I said that. Um, but like, I, I mean, the graph is pretty self-explanatory, I guess. You know, you have a cap, uh, commodity as labor power, sells labor power, goes to work, gets a wage, consumes some means of subsistence, re reproduces their labor power. There we go, off to the races, go back to work. Um, so the interesting thing about social composition is if uh, there was only technical composition, we would just be dead because we wouldn't sleep. Um, so, uh, but the uh, lines I think are more blurry now than ever. Um, so what's very interesting is uh, I think right here we have the commodity as labor power in the first, and then we have the obviously the purchase of labor power, labor power entering into the production process to receive the wage, to leave the technical composition sound like a C uh, ESPN sports announcer or something. Leave the social composition. He left the social composition. He's going down to the store and he's getting his means of subsistence. And then he's reproducing his labor power as a commodity to sell it and enter back into the technical composition. And that was a beautiful play. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have the organization of workers and their dependence into class society through consumption and reproduction. And this sort of illuminates, I think, uh, the the way that we are organized into a class before being employed by capital. Because um, so, social composition, uh, you know, considers all these other factors of like our life, all these other ways we uh, experience oppressions and, uh, you know, different, just even subjective processes and, and uh, uh, ways of thinking that, are, that, are, that are, we're, we're um, dealing with, like, uh, you know, very diffuse, complex, and uh, uh, difficult to understand. Um, processes. Uh, social reproduction is uh, by no means simple. Um, uh, but this can really help us understand the leap from the technical composition to the political composition. Uh, because it's like, um, you know, you're not only form your, uh, you know, political standpoint um, through the through work, right, you form it after work as well. Um, you're still part of capital capitalism, you're reproducing uh, yourself as labor power. Um, and to explain this sort of, you know, uh, enter a class before you're employed by capital, you just think of like a child in a working class family. Um, you know, they're only indirected, directly connected to the technical composition through their parents. They live off their parents' wages, you know, the, in the means of subsistence we have, oh, I got to feed my child. Um, and then here's where it gets a little more, uh, a little weirder, I guess. Um, well, this Ed Emery piece is the one I meant to send and it's very interesting when he talks about war. Um, and I think he's just like, the, the first quote on the top left is uh, quite on point. I mean, the enemy studies class composition in order to fracture it, break it, disperse it, permanently dissipate its strength. We, for our part, study class composition in order to strengthen it, consolidate it, and turn it into a real basis of power. Um, so, like, you know, Workers' Inquiry doesn't just look at the material organization of work. It is, like, completely secretarian and partisan. It's, like, 100% aimed at uh, analyzing, like, the emergent struggles and developing forms of organization, strategies, and tactics. 
all of these things specifically, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, how we're going to organize ourselves, um, come from an inquiry into uh, the material conditions, it's giving the material conditions content. Uh, not every situation in capitalism is the same. There's no dogmatic program. We cannot follow the, the uh, words of our heroes and apply their, their tactics and strategies and forms of organization to a completely different um, situation. Uh, still many, obviously many similarities, but uh, I think that the real strength of the workers' inquiry is that uh, all these sort of very abstract questions of, I'm a Leninist because I believe this, I'm a Trotskyist because I believe this, I'm a autonomous because I believe this is like, well, like what's gonna work? Like, you know, what what is the, the analysis of the working class tell us it needs to happen now, you know? Um, and there's a letter of like Marx's when he, uh, someone's talking about an international workers association. He's like, what, why are you doing that, dude? Like, there's no like workers organization stuff going on in the uh, factories. Like, you're just gonna sort of sit around and, you know, sort of do a, confer the right politics from above um, type of thing. I can find the letter I was looking at earlier today. Uh, so I don't know why I wrote this stupid shit at the bottom, but I'm gonna read it. Um, capital is continually decomposing the political composition of the class by introducing new machines to rearrange the technical composition, as well as by multiplying institutions, bureaucratic social relations, and uh, social semiotics of all kinds, really, like, you know, entertainment, just like the family arrangement itself, uh, all these sort of um, uh, material processes of, uh, you know, um, produ the production of subjectivity is sort of what I'm getting at, but it's maybe a bit too, like, heady or whatever, head ass right now. Um, so to deal with all kinds of working class malcontent, even including unions and reformist communist parties, um, you know, like, this is like a sort of big deal around the time was these communist parties were awful. Like they're just, you know, they're, uh, they're um, like, they're just shutting down like revolutions. They're, they hate them. Um, <laughs> like, you know, if you take the Italian communist party um, aligned with the Christian Democrats, you take the uh, French uh, communist party um, aligned with uh, de Gaulle's government, um to uh you know uh, total like uh um propaganda warfare too oh the you know the workers just want better wages the students just are nervous about their finals meanwhile they've literally taken over schools and factories um so but of course more obvious forces of ca capitalist domination managerial expansion the police public schools the criminal justice system and of course my main man bill, bill o'reilly um, and I think that Ed Emery is absolutely right when he says, I believe that we must see it in terms of war. War is being waged on us, class war, sometimes literally by military means. We would do well to respond in the language of war. The rhetoric of earlier communist and anarchist movements always had a strong military flavor to it, but the notion of war is less than fashionable nowadays. When I say respond in the language of war, of course I don't mean rushing around killing people. I mean that we begin to speak once again the language of tactics, strategy, fields of battle, mobilization, mobilizing of forces, application of technology, and a theory of war. Um, and so, of course, Karl von Clausewitz, uh, my guy, he says uh, to, in the very beginning of Amor, he says, war is nothing but a duel on an extensive scale, supposing ourselves two wrestlers. Each strives by physical force to compel the other to submit to his will. Each endeavors to throw his adversary and thus render him incapable of further resistance. Um, and like, yeah, I mean, capital is like global, it's just a war like itself, like that it sounds like, it sounds like capital trying to get you to go to work um, to me, um, a sort of, you know, capital makes way by peace, a sort of generalized war, you know, the fuck is the war on terror? Um, and that's the end. Uh, I'm going to read these two quotes real quick because they're wonderful. Um, theory develops precisely and absolutely alongside the capacity to exercise violence. 
Violence is the fabric in which all political relations intertwine. The state's domination is the domination of violence and legality in all constitutional forms. The normal forms of capitalist command are violence, pure and simple. Marxism is a realization that violence inhabits not only formal relations, but also the everyday relations of production and life. It is the discovery that the science of capital is the science of capitalist violence. One of the ways in which capital organizes its violence is upon, upon the subalterns. Marxism, therefore, is destruction and overthrow. Bringing this relationship between knowledge and violence directly into class analysis is a secretarian standpoint, the worker's standpoint, the point of Marxist theory. There's no, like, there's no class collaboration or any of that shit. Like, uh, if you see it in terms of war, it's not like, oh, okay, you know. Um, and then this other quote, you know, a little more upbeat, I guess, uh, kind of funny cows can do a lot of things but all we care about is that they produce as much milk and meat as possible and so we breed them inject them rear them and control them to do only that sometimes their udders are so distended by excessive production they tear split and spill we are cattle to capital we too have become distorted and figured and disfigured by its universal rule it brands us as abstract labor but we are also concrete individuals the form does not exhaust the content and thus in this seemingly innocuous Non-identity between form and content is the fundamental reason why one day we will escape from capital's rule. That is so optimistic. My guy, Ian Wright, very brilliant thinker. Uh, and I'm going to be done. I'm done. I'm sorry if I went too long. I have no idea.